Lord add his um, blessing to the reading of the word. Thanks, Samantha. Well, it does my heart good on Father's Day to sing in Spanish. So I hope we have many more days. Why are you guys crying back there? <laughs> Isn't the Lord good? So good to praise the Lord. Amen. Well, let's, uh, let's take a look at this text of Scripture on Father's Day. And let me, let me kind of contextualize it for you. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 to 7. Um, imagine or think with me that this is the Apostle Paul writing to Timothy. And I want you to look at the first two verses of the letter. Because if you look at the first two verses of the letter, you automatically get a sense of the relationship between Paul and Timothy. Gail, you just prayed for spiritual fathers. And Paul is deeply committed to Timothy as a son in the Lord. Timothy, we all have different backgrounds. John said that earlier. Positive, uplifting, encouraging relationships with our fathers. Difficult, challenging, hard relationships with our dads. And probably for all of us, a mix of all of that, right? At different points in time. Uh, Timothy was raised, as a, had a Gentile Greek father and um, Jewish mother and grandmother, Christian grandmother and mother. And um, he was called to the gospel through the, their ministry. And then Paul comes along and invites Timothy in ministry and mission with him. And listen to what it says at the beginning. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope to Timothy, my true child in the faith. My true, true child in the faith. And so on Father's Day, we're reading a text of Scripture written by a spiritual father who loves Timothy deeply. He'll write him a couple of letters. His second letter is his last letter that we have where he's dying and he's writing to Timothy to encourage Timothy to grab the torch and carry the flame and to stand firm. And, and you get a sense in the second letter that Timothy is not by nature courageous. He's not. Uh, he says to Timothy in the first chapter of his next letter, his final letter, that we have not been given a spirit of what? Fear or timidity, but of power, love, and self-control. And so you can imagine a father saying to his son, Come on, son. Let's man up. Or in another sense, you can trust God to help you man up. You can trust God to help you in the middle of this. You can believe the hope of the God of the gospel because we are not fighting against just human powers in the strength of human powers. We are going out into the nations in the name of the living God. And uh, here is here's Paul writing to Timothy and saying, Timothy, we're on the winning side. And when I was preparing this and praying over this, the picture I had in my mind was an Old Testament passage where David comes from Bethlehem to the battlefield and Goliath is standing mocking the people, the, the army of Israel. And David walks up as his brothers and everyone are cowering before Goliath and he asks this question, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he would mock the, ar the, the God of the, of the armies is the language, the Lord of hosts. And David is stunned by the cowardice of all those that are around him. Now David is a picture of Christ, our great Savior. But in that picture, I sort of got a sense of what Paul's telling Timothy here. Timothy, go to God with this. Timothy, Go to the Lord and rely on the Lord and be strengthened in your heavenly Father. And, you know, on Father's Day, we ask the question, often I ask the question, what do I get my dad for Father's Day? And uh, so I, I did. I talked to my dad, and you know what I get? The answer every year now is, I don't need anything. Any of you get that answer? I don't need anything. So he got a really personal lovely Amazon card from Mary Ann and I <laughs> this year. So when you find out what it is you need, you can go get it. If you are. So I, I know he could get a jar of cashews. Who knows what he's getting? But, um, but you know, one of the questions we have when we come to the Word of God in a text like 1 Timothy 2, which we're studying because of verse 5, our fighter verse. Our fighter verse is the gospel. There is one God and one mediator 
between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. Isn't that great news? But the context of that is Paul's urging Timothy to pray bold prayers, to plead with God in the face of everything that's coming against him. And he gives Timothy good reason to come to God in prayer. And that's my goal. Waterbrook, I want you to pray bold prayers. Fathers, I'm, I'm going to urge you to pray bold prayers over your family, over your children, over those that don't know Christ, over your co-workers, right? Isn't it easy to lose heart? Isn't it easy for us to stop praying bold prayers because we wonder where you are, God? Why is this taking so long? It goes in another direction. Paul writes to Timothy and he says in chapter 2, verse 1, that Samantha just read, I urge you, right? Look at he says, I urge you. In fact, he actually says, first of all, I urge you. You're a dad. You're coming to your son, spiritual son. You say, I'm going to tell you some things, but I'm going to tell you this first. Pray. Pray to God. I urge you to go to him and make supplications, prayers, intercessions, thanksgiving. You hear the loaded language there? It's almost like the, the repeated bullets flying out of, the, out of the spiritual gun. Pray, intercession, thanksgiving. I, I, he's, he's giving a wider range, general words, specific words. Pray, 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 pray specifically, pray generally, pray all the time to God. And uh, Keller has this great quote when he talks about, you know, God the Father, and he says this, he says, the only person who wakes a king up at 3 a.m. for a glass of water is a child, and we have that kind of access. Amen. That's a great truth to hold on to. Do you understand that, friends? God, in Jesus Christ, has adopted us into his family and given us access, and if you were to ask God the Father, what do you want from your children? The first thing he says is, come to me. Come first to me. Come unhesitating to me. Come boldly to me. Come now to me, right? Isn't that what we hear here? And so this is what I want to do on Father's Day. I want to load the arsenal of your spiritual weaponry with four reasons in this text why you should go first, go fast, go fully to God in prayer. You want that? Okay, so here they are. In this text of Scripture, four glorious truths of God the Father that I hope you pray. His sovereign power, His sweetest pleasure, His strategic plan and purpose in Christ, and His perfect patience. And if you look through this text, you'll see all of those things. So the first thing is His sovereign power. And this is the point I want you to see. Bold praying honors the absolute power and supremacy over God, of God over all sovereigns and over all circumstances. And all I mean by that is in this letter, Paul is saying to Timothy, God is king. And he's saying it to Timothy when Nero is the emperor. In an intimidating time for Christians. Belarus is nothing compared to the Roman Empire at this time. And Timothy is going to carry the mantle of the gospel ministry from courageous Paul. Timothy does not have built into him a natural backbone. He needs a spiritual backbone. And the spiritual backbone will not come from looking in the mirror. It will be looking up to God. Not reading the news, not doing what they say now people do, uh, what do they call it, doom scrolling on your phone. Right? Just kind of quickly going through the news till you're fearful and depressed. <laughs> right? There's just a ton of that going on. You don't doom scroll anymore. You God fix on the God who is the God and King over all. So I want to show you in this text, he says, pray in this passage of Scripture all kinds of prayers for who? Kings and all who are in high positions. That's, that's Nero. Pray for them, and he says, 
uh, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. And what he's saying there is the language in the Greek is that there is an internal and external peace we're going after. Right? So those words there when he says that we might lead a peaceful and quiet life, and then he says, and then he, and then he adds the word godly and dignified in every way. He's talking about the fact that there is internally and externally tumult in our lives. But what he's telling us is the tumult of the culture, the tumult of America in 2021, the chaos and corruption and the difficulty and all the anger and hostility that's out there. Let's just remind ourselves, God is greater than all of that. He's greater than all of that. And he can work in all of that for the advancement of the gospel. So he says, pray that contextually will be in an environment that is conducive to the gospel. This is not peace and quiet so I can sit and relax and live my own comfortable Minnesota lifestyle. This is getting away from that anxiety in my heart that keeps me from going to my neighbor. So um, last night, Marianne and I had a sweet little time out on the edge of Lake Waconia. We got out our hammocks like a couple of 15-year-olds and attached two trees on the edge of Lake Waconia and waited for the Bartos to sail by, but they didn't. Or maybe they didn't. We didn't notice. <laughs> we're, we're sitting there soaking it in. This is peace and quiet. There are no problems in the world. The sun is setting. That's not what this text is about. This is not extricating yourself from a world. It's engaging and having God bring the world to its knees because he's king. Making it clear who is Lord. And let me show you in the text because in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and at the end, he brackets it with the declaration of the absolute sovereignty of God. So if you look at chapter 1, notice Paul's testimony in verse 15. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. What is the saying? Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I'm the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason that in me as the first, the foremost of sinners, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who would believe in him for eternal life. So Paul says, and he's, he, he talks about his sinfulness and his, his opposition to Christianity and says God came and got him. And then there's this worship line that we sang earlier in the service. Look at verse 17. To the king of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Who's bowing the knee here? Saul of Tarsus. To him be the glory forever and ever. Go to chapter 6 at the end of this letter. So you know that this is what is dominating the Apostle Paul's mindset. He says at the end in Verse 13, I charge you in the presence of God, chapter 6, verse 13, I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession. I love the confession of Jesus before Pontius Pilate. Remember what Jesus said to Pontius Pilate? You could do nothing if my father didn't let you, <laughs> right? He is the king. Of the, this is a great so to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. When those robes of white and the sun breaks the darkness that we just sang. Right? He says, which he will display at the proper time. Who? He who is blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Proverbs 21 one says, the king's heart is a stream of water in the hands of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wills. Is that good news? So one of the things that will make you bold in, share in, in your prayer life is believing that God is king over it all. King over all kings, king over all peoples. And we ought to pray that God, who is king of kings, and Lord of Lords would minister to all kinds of people, people on high and people who are nobodies. The nothings of this world and those who think they rule the world, there's only one who rules the world. It's Jesus Christ. 
So that is his sovereign power. That will give you boldness, won't it? Secondly, his sweetest pleasure. You need to get this. We've been singing about it. We're going to take communion today and remind ourselves in a bit of this. What is God's sweetest pleasure? As you read through Scripture, you see he's sovereign over kings. He brings kings up. He brings them down. He humbles them. You see it all the way through Scripture. But in the middle of that, what's he doing? He is saving a people, sinners, out of darkness and bringing them into his glorious light. Right? And that's what he delights to do. He delights that we would pray. So those of you who have stopped praying boldly for people in your life, start praying. Because one good reason to pray this kind of prayer is it pleases your Father. You want to know what he wants. So listen to how it goes here. He says in verse uh, 3 of First Timothy 2, verse, uh, yes, verse 3, this is what? Good, and it's pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So here's what we think. We kind of think this person's more appropriate for salvation. This person's really gone. Nero's really bad, all this kind of stuff. God loves to save whomever God is free and choosing to save, right? He'll save a Nero, right? He wants to do that. Did the Roman Empire come under the knee, bow the knee to Jesus? It's nothing for him. But this is what pleases God, that we would honor our Father by believing that our Father loves to save sinners. Boy, we've got to get this in us. When it's dark and it's difficult and when we think people have blown it and gone beyond you know, the, pl- the path of redemption, are you not glad that God loves to save sinners? Uh, the Gospel of Luke has this story where Jesus tells different parables of lost coins and lost sheep, right? Remember those stories? And then it, in Luke chapter 15, verse 7, here's this great verse. I tell you the truth, there'll be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. You want to know what to give God for Father's Day? Give him a prayer of faith that he might save the lost. And I would even say pray over the people you're less inclined, least inclined to pray for. Ezekiel 33, verse 11, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. No pleasure. But rather that the wicked should turn from his way and live. Are you not glad that's your father? Because sometimes we've been raised in homes where our fathers have only been condemning, only reminding us of our failures and shame. But we have the father of the prodigal son who takes up his robes and runs down the road and embraces his wayward son. That's his pleasure. David Platt says, when you begin to pray for all kinds of people in the world to be saved, Jews and Gentiles, friends and enemies, Democrats and Republicans, reached and unreached people groups, your heart is coming in line with the heart of God himself. He desires their salvation. Will that not make you bold? If you're not bold, you don't know your father. You don't know his heart. A brother here, Jim, gave his testimony on uh, Friday night, and he will tell you, that he was far from God when God came and got him. And he will testify with weeping tears that he has hurt people and his family and his children. He grieved over his sin, but it's a marvelous thing. You can grieve over your sin and glory in the grace of Jesus Christ because that's a trustworthy statement. That's our God. It is sweet a sweet fragrance and aroma in the nostrils of God when the offerings and the sacrifices of prayer are raised up to him on behalf of all kinds of people who are in deep darkness and far from God and even mocking him at the foot of the cross. To hear his son say, Father, what? Forgive them. They know not what they do. That is not just the heart of the son. That's the son who knows the father. That's the son. Okay, thirdly, not only is I call this is kind of a weird one, the strategic plan of God. This is our fighter verse. But what I mean by that is that as Paul is encouraging Timothy to offer up 
these urgent prayers to God for the salvation of all kinds of people, he then says this line that we were memorizing, there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. That statement is a pinnacle statement in all of the revelation of the Bible. In fact, you see that God regularly in the scriptures will send someone into a place of authority and power in order to bring deliverance to God's people. So, you know Joseph in the book of Genesis? I think in a few years when we finish Genesis, we'll get to Joseph. Um, but, you know, we're going to try to get there. But in, in Genesis chapter 50, we have this, the dying of Jacob and we have Joseph with his brothers and his brothers know what they did to him and he comes and he says to them this statement as he is now second in command under King Pharaoh God raised him up listen to what Joseph says as for you you meant evil against me but God meant it for good why to bring about that many people should be kept alive you see the Bible begins with the story of God putting his representative in a place of authority in order to bring deliverance to his people. Happens over and over again in the Old Testament. Happens with Nehemiah. Nehemiah is taken off into captivity. Under, he's under King Artaxerxes. And then he gets a word back that Jerusalem is still laying in ruins and he begins to weep. And if he goes in to the king's presence as a cupbearer to the king and he's not smiling He's the wine guy. He comes in and he cheers the king up. If he comes in with a frown, he doesn't just lose his frown, he loses his head. And yet he knows he has to go to the king on behalf of the people. And the Bible tells us in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 4, he said, so I prayed to the God of heaven and then I spoke to the king. Doesn't God do that regularly? I'm going to tell you something. I want to tell you this. We have this great privilege through Jesus Christ. It also says, in, in, uh, I, I didn't put it on here, but do you remember Esther? Esther discovers through Mordecai that Haman has arranged with the king to have a day where they're going to execute all the Jewish people. And Mordecai comes to the gate and he sends a message to her. And he says, you've got to talk to the king. And if she goes to the king... Uh, without an invitation, she will die unless he holds out the scepter. And Esther says to him, call a fast amongst all the people, and I will go to the king. If I die, I die. You can keep going. Daniel, right? Or that was uh, Esther with King Assyrius and, uh, and, and uh, Daniel with King Nebuchadnezzar. You just go through story after story. But the big story of the Bible the grand story of the Bible is that there was one in heaven. There's only one God. And there's only one mediator between God and man. And God said to his son, you go into the world. And he came into the world and stood in our place. And he bore mediator. And this is what we need to understand about the mediation of Jesus. Jesus died in to stand, the man Jesus Christ took on our flesh in order that he might bear our sin and die, taking the wrath of God upon himself so that the righteousness of God might be poured out on us. That it's settled between us and God, but that's not the end of it. Jesus did that so that he might ever live to intercede for us. We have a mediator right now before the Father pleading our case. Now, if that doesn't give you boldness, and that's what Paul says in this next. This is the ultimate plan of God. This is this great story of the plan of God that God sent. He, he has plotted all the way through to put someone in the greatest position of power. There's someone greater than, than Pharaoh. There's someone greater than King Hazarus. There's someone greater than Nebuchadnezzar. There's someone greater than Nero. Right? Who is it? That's right, Jesus Christ, who's been lifted up into the highest place. And he, Jesus, has been placed in the very throne room of God to intercede and to represent and to plead to the Father on my behalf. And you and I, Ephesians says, have been given access to the Father through the Son. That's the great news. 
Listen to David Platt. He says, Jesus is not our mediator in the past, not just our mediator in the past through what he did on the cross, as glorious as that is. He lives as our mediator right now at the Father's right hand. That's right. Today, at this moment, Jesus is interceding for us. Standing before God on our behalf, he is the constant, continual means by which we approach the throne. The curtain was torn. He has opened up a new and living way into the very throne room of God. My dear friends, you want to please the Father? Walk in the pathway that the forerunner has gone. Come to the Father. Plead with the Father. Pray with the Father. He's bought it with the price of His Son, and His Son now pleads our case at the right hand of the Father. And He is doing that, not so that we would just not be afraid, but so that we would go and declare to the nations, our God reigns. Our God reigns. And so finally, I want you to see in this text, there's also this um, perfect patience of God. Look at verse 7. Paul does this. Chapter 1, chapter 2, keep coming back to it. He's aware of this, that he has been appointed as a messenger to the Gentiles to be a living demonstration that God receives sinners. Isn't that good? Aren't you glad for the Peters and the Pauls of the Bible that remind us that God has come to save sinners? So it says in verse 7 of chapter 2, I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. For this I was appointed a preacher and apostle. I'm not, I'm telling you the truth. I'm not lying. When Paul stops and says to Timothy, who's his son, I tell you the truth, I'm not lying. It's not because Timothy thinks Paul's a liar. I think it's because the truth is so unbelievable. For Paul, the truth is so unbelievable that God would save him and make him a minister of the gospel to the Gentiles. If you want proof that God will hear the prayers of his people on behalf of kings and poor people who are far and rebellious, Paul is saying this, yeah, is Nero burning people in their gardens? Guess what I was doing. Is Nero about as repulsive to human experience as we could get? Guess what I was doing. And this is a trustworthy saying, deserving full acceptance. Christ Jesus came in to the world to save sinners, and I'm the worst of the bunch. We, we brought Gabe Zapata on staff because he fits the qualifications of a pastor at Waterbrook. He's a sinner in desperate need of a Savior, and he knows it. And he sings of the saving power of Christ. The beauty of being at Waterbrook is that we're a bunch of messy children who have been made completely accepted in the sight of the Father, adopted into his family, empowered and sealed by the Spirit, secured for eternity, and sent on a mission to be both a living demonstration and a vocal proclamation, my dear friends, Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. You need no one else. There is no other mediator before God. You can come to Christ today. Would that, is that good enough reason to pray to the Father? To be bold? The blood of the Son has been poured out. The sacrifice of the Son has been received. The resurrection has happened. The Son is seated at the right hand. The Spirit has been poured out, and He's coming again. Let's pray. Let's plead. Let's go. Right? Let's do it. Let's pray together. So God in heaven... When we take communion in a moment, we will say to one another, I'm telling you the truth and I'm not lying. Jesus Christ came in the world to save sinners. Big sinners, bad sinners. Repulsive, ugly, publicly offensive sinners. 
God has raised him up and given him all authority in heaven and on earth. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Every tongue will confess that he's Lord. Mm, Father, you love these prayers, so hear our prayer. I'm going to ask people just to quietly pray right now. That person you stopped praying for, would you pray for them right now? That person you were weeping over on the way to church today, would you lift up their names? Don't hesitate. Maybe it was you. Maybe you were pleading. Maybe you were pleading over your own heart. Well, just say, God, forgive me. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just. He'll forgive your sins, cleanse you from all your unrighteousness. Be bold. Be bold. He wants you to be bold. God's people said.